just hope it works. Okay, it's recording. Hello, Elaine. Yeah. Hi there. How are you? Hi, Elaine. Hi, I'm good. So, apparently, I don't know how to set up Facebook events. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> So it's just going to be the two of us. So please feel free to jump in and ask questions as we go along. Um, today's class is about the Illuminous Brotherhood, which is an Afro-Creole um, circle that was formed in the late 1800s in New Orleans. Oh, in New Orleans. Oh. Yes. Um, the the, it wasn't new to New Orleans, but it was the first one that was predominantly all African Creole um, makeup. The first one in New Orleans was by a Joseph Barthet, and I have the notes in the Zoom group chat if you want to yeah. pick pictures or I can type them to you at another time so that I know both of you. Um, the first uh, circle that was formed was by Joseph Barthet. He was part of the Swedenborg phase of magnetism and mesmerism. And so when he formed that group, it was more of a metaphysical magnetism uh, group, a seance that they held. And he formed it in 1945. He had immigrated to New Orleans and he had brought that belief um, with him. And when he got there, he produced he was actually very prolific. So he wrote journals um, that produced the communications that he had. He wrote a manual. One of the manuals was the ABCs of communications with spirit. That's not the actual title. That's titles in French. <laughs> um, in 1858, he wrote a book, um, a novel, just talking about spiritualism, but doing it in a novel and a fiction format. Um, more likely than not to try and reach a wider audience. Um, after him came Charles Testut, mm -hmm. another French immigrant who at this point is when the Fox sisters came on the scene in 1848. So now they're going from that magnetism belief system into the spiritualist communicating with directly with spirit um, through the seance table with mediums. So Charles Tattoo, another French immigrant, who also brought his beliefs in spiritualism with him when he came to New Orleans, mm -hmm. um, he wrote a novel. He also wrote a novel. Um, and writing novels during that time period was very common in terms of, hi, Prue. Mm -hmm. um, very common hey. in terms of, how's it going? <laughs> Apparently the time's wrong on Facebook, so it says it's over. So we're just going to record it. It's being recorded, so if you don't want to be seen, you can hide your face. Um, I'm recording it so that I can just share it. Oh, okay. With uh, anyone who might want to, who were like, I, you weren't there. <laughs> no, I was. I just don't know what happened. Um, so writing novels was a very common way. Writing, period was a common way of talking about spiritualism, especially during that, that beginning time frame um, in the mid 1850s. So they were, they were writing novels, they were writing poems, they were writing manuals, they were forming newspapers as we know about. But in the South, their focus was a little different than the North's focus when it came to spiritualism. Um, because at the time, we're talking right before the Civil War, but the, the rumblings started, you know, uh, the change, the need for change, um, the not wanting to change, the, you know, that whole thing that, that had already started, um, was already starting pre the Civil War, or else we had Civil War that had started earlier. Um, and so their focus in terms of communicating with spirit was more along the lines of what should we do, what does this new world, that is going to come on, come about, look like, how should we uh, walk through it? How should we handle ourselves? What should we be fighting for or not fighting for? Who should we be supporting? Who we should we not be supporting? So they had a very 
uh, pragmatic way of looking at commit, uh, communicating with spirit that would be a little bit beyond, I lost a loved one and I want to reconnect with that loved one and I want to know that they're okay and that they're still, I guess they are still with me in my heart, even if they're not physically here around me. Um, so that's, and to back it up, I'll give it a little bit of history about African Creoles in New Orleans. Um, so African Creoles lived in a very different space than slaves and white or European. At that time, it would be still European because you still had French. They identified as French. You still had Italians, identified as, and so on. So they, I, they sat in the space in between. Most of them immigrated from the Caribbeans, where um, there was a there was the Haitian uh, Civil War. So a lot of them were landowners. They had already had wealth. They already had status. They already, and so during that Haitian Civil War, you know, you're the landowner. We're coming for you. And so there's packing up. There's escaping, and then the place they went to was New Orleans. The New Orleans at the time was French, then it was Spanish, then it was French, then it was Spanish, then, <laughs> you know. So, and the French and the Portuguese were also part of the Haitian and the Caribbean and a big part of the Caribbean um, uprisings and conflict that was happening. So when the African Creole came to New Orleans, they brought their wealth with them. They brought that, that, brought that entitled feeling also with them. So when they got to New Orleans, they were able to buy homes. They were made free, and their children stayed free. Um, they were able to go into businesses, but they also had very limited uh, uh, freedoms in terms of being a part of the government, um, determining where they could go, where they can eat. Like they created laws for the Afro Creoles to. If you're going to have slaves, you need to treat these slaves like everybody else treats slaves and, and that sort of thing because they didn't want that merging to happen. It's like we give you just enough so that you can own land and be free, but not so much that you're equal to us, but not so little that you might feel like you want to bond with the slaves and say, hey, let's have a revolution sort of thought. So, and they were okay with that. So most of their jobs were, they were tutors, they were tended to be private tutors, they were well educated. They spoke multiple language, French being a lot of their first language, um, English being second or third. Um, they sent their kids over back to Europe for education. The first was this, they sent their kids to France, and to, you know, to, they were extremely well educated, very scholarly, you know, prolific writers, like we know with spiritual, our pioneers, prolific writers. <laughs> um, and they became private tutors and, and, and the European home, more upscale European homes. Um, they would open schools. They would, uh, they did different sorts of businesses that were respectable, maintained their status. Um, and in order to feel included and a part of the group, they would, they would, um, they, they treated slaves the way everybody else treated slaves. So Henri Louis was no different. He was born in New Orleans as a free um, African Creole. His parents were from the islands and had immigrated to um, New Orleans during that, that the Haitian War, um, and then he so he grew up with that privilege. The other thing that was really common among African Creoles, and most people in New Orleans even today, they're staunch Catholics. Heavy, 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 heavy Catholics. Um, so they were very active in their in their religious community as well. They would they also help guide and fund and raise funds for and open up schools within the the Catholic parish, the Catholic churches to educate the youth. Um, 
lots of charity and social work within the Catholic community, married within the Catholic community, but they also had a stair system in the Catholic community as well, though. Again, they, they sat in between, we're not slaves, but we're not for as free as the white. So they, they had to kind of do a dance in that middle lane as well within the Catholic society. So, and African Creoles and, and both and being such heavy Catholics, um, as it gets closer to the Civil War, Henri was, was, was from a family that was heavily Catholic. Um, I don't know, because I haven't read anything that they they, they talk to, more likely than not, they probably were, but I haven't read any those exact words. They were just considered African Creoles. Um, that, that, what was that? Oh, Catholic. So being a part of a heavy Catholic family, spiritualism is not something that they would take on and be like, yeah, that sounds like a great thing. Let me let me find out about it. No. <laughs> That's like, no. Um, however, Henri, after his father died, had a visitation from his father. It, and it spooked, it, obviously, it freaked him out. Like, Dad, you're dead. Why are you talking to me? Why do I see you? You know, kind of thing. Um, he kind of ignored it for a little bit, but other things kept happening where he realized, okay, there's something going on. Being part of the Afro Creole community, remember also at this time, voodoo is also a part of the, has been brought to this community. And being African Creole, you all interact. It's not a huge group, you know, it's not, you know, it's a small group. So you all know each other. Whether or not you all don't go to Catholic Church to get the same service doesn't mean you don't know so and so down the street. So he was friends with Laveau, he was friends with J.B. Valmore. He was also a known healer, big time healer. Emma Harding mentions him briefly in her book about the time when she went down to New Orleans to speak. Jamie Valmore was outside. She was exhausted. She had been lecturing all morning. Um, she went outside to kind of catch her breath and she was about ready to say, get it, I'm done. I can't get no more. I'm, I'm exhausted, you know. Because they talked for in trance or did or inspirational talking for hours you know, on end. And you also have all of these people with their energies in the room. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this, you know, after about four or five hours of this going on, you, you're pretty tired. So she went outside just to kind of say, okay, am I going to keep going? Am I done? She saw him on the, on the, just saw him on the sidewalk and said, I want him to come with me inside. So he, he obliged. And he sat up on the stage and she was able to go on for, I, I think, another five or six hours. Because his, his ability to heal and his energy on that level was so strong that she not only felt it, but it helped sustain her for the rest of the lecture series. Um, he was actually a blacksmith, and pe but people would go to him when they could, no other remedy would work for healing. Apparently he had healed a priest who had traveled there and lost his eyesight and restored his eyesight. Um, he also was a medium. And he used to have his own informal circles, but his circles, he was a free for all. Like, show up that day, he happened to be here at eight o'clock when I decided I'm going to have a circle. Come on down, sit down. Henri, when he decided to explore the possibility of being a medium and explore spiritualism, Henri was coming from a place of very structured, very, um, you know, timelines. Uh, this is how you do things. This is how we, you know, order. There, um, there are rules that we need to follow. He, because, because of his upbringing and how he was raised, of course, that translated into how he, in, he decided to be a part of spiritualism. Any questions before I keep going? No? Okay. So, <clears throat> at this point, Joseph Barthet had already started his seance circles. Um, 
Charles Testude had already started his seance circles, um, their, their tables were mixed. So they had French immigrants, Europeans, Native New Orleans, and they had African, African Creoles at their tables. Um, because of that diversity, that gave Balmore, um, Henri, and others an opportunity to be a part of these circles before they started their own. At some point, um, around the late 1860s, uh, is when Henri says, we're having, okay, I'm going to coordinate our own circle, and that's where the Circle of Harmonique is born. His circle he, that he created was a lot, was very different from Valmore's circle. So where Valmore was very kind of lackadaisical, anybody can come, open circle. Um, Henri was like, nope, we're not having an open circle. It's going to be structured, you invite only, and I expect you to be here every single time. <laughs> or as close to every single time as you physically can. Um, so he also held two circles a week. So the first circle was on Mondays, and his second circle was on Fridays. Monday was like the high circle, because you, you've got to understand, Catholicism is still going to kind of be a part of that formation of the circle. Like, because, you know, when you're born and bred in, in something, and that's all you know, even though you're breaking out, you're still going to kind of bring the structures you've learned from whatever religion you were a part of prior to that into it. So you know how there's high, high holy mass and more like a casual mass later in the week. So he had high holy Monday seance table, which was very, um, that was the table to be at. And then Friday was a little bit more the ordinary people. The people who beg to be a part of it, but they're not ready for Monday circle, but we can put them in Friday circle kind of thing. Um, at this table sat a various group of people. They were mostly men, mostly Afro-Creole men. This was an all Afro-Creole circle, by the way. So um, you didn't, Bartha wasn't part of the circle and a few others were, um, were not a part of the circle. Um, it was a mostly male circle. There was one or two women who were part of the circle. Now, there's no writings in his works of what it was mostly men and not a lot of women, even though a lot of women came through the seances. Another thing is, and, and I'm backtracking a little bit here, he wrote every seance that he had. He wrote it down. He would transcribe everything that came from spirit, what spirit said. It became, it's called the Grand Jean Seance Register. There are 35, over 35 volumes in, in it because he was prolific. There is two years worth of volumes in which there was no circle meeting. He just sat by himself and kept writing when he what came to him from spirit. So that would be around the last two years, between 1875 and like 1877. Um, the circle time frame is considered between 1858 and 1875. At the same time, there were, um, so at the table, going now I'm coming forward. Valmore was at the table until he transitioned. Most were at the table until they transitioned. Um, Henri, who obviously he created the circle. Francois Petit Dublet. Louise was the theme, was one of the few females that there was record of being at his table. There's no more about Louise other than she was an excellent medium. We know it was a she. <laughs> um, and she was a, a, a very regular of the table. Um, the, uh, Jean Pasti, Nelson De, Desbra, I'm sure I'm butchering these names. Um, Adolf, du, Adolf Paulin, Paulin, Charles, and a few others frequent his table. Um, two of them, though, Paulin and Charles, were scholars and poets, and they had their own, they would hold their own seance circle um, that was more literary inspired. And what came out of that, there were two books written. The first one was the Literary Album, a journal of young men 
lovers of literature. And the second one was a compilation album, uh, Les Chanel's, a book of poetry that 17 of the Afro-Creole poets contributed to that volume. Um, and that's just to reiterate the educational status of the, of the Afro-Creole community. They took it very seriously being Afro-Creole. They knew they held this very ten tennis kind of line space. And so they tried to maintain that culture. Um, so they hold circles and they hold circles obviously through the Civil War. They, there's a pause for the Civil War. <laughs> And then they, they start right back up. Henri, Louis, Henri Ray, the person who created the circle, he, he participated in the Civil War. He fought for both sides. He was um, a part of the, the Union and the Confederate Native Guard. He started off with the Confederate Native Guard um, and then switched. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is where Cora Scott, Richmond Daniel's husband comes in, Nathaniel Daniel, Nathan Daniel. I don't know why I'm just saying Nathaniel Daniel. Nathan Daniel comes in because he was one of the, he was like the, he ran the colored guard. And I believe Henri was part of that guard, the, the native guard. And I believe the black native guard. So there was two. The Confederates had an all white or all European, and then they had an all black or Afro Creole guard, and Nathan Daniel was in charge of the Afro Creole guard. Um, during that time, what had happened was they they were on an island, they weren't far from New Orleans. So they were on one of the islands outside of New Orleans, and they weren't getting any supplies or any food and being expected to still hold the line. And they were being deeply mistreated by their white counterparts. And they, and they were starving. And so Nathan's like, what do y'all want to do? And they're like, we're done. And so basically at some point, I'm a little fuzzy because I don't just, that war history is the only history that I'm like, eh, they fought. <laughs> So, but as a result of the mistreatment is when the shift happens in the brain. See, at the beginning, the Afro Creole were nativists. So basically, it's we. This is our land. You're not coming to tell us how we should live. You're not going to come in here and tell us how we should be. You're not going to come in here and tell us how to be. So they supported the Confederacy in that aspect. It wasn't so much that they had a problem with slavery ended, ending or not ending. Their biggest issue was being told what to do. We have our freedom. You're not going to tell us what, how we should live. So, and as an African Creole, you are in that weird, precarious um, space. Because, a little background, when you, as an African American, when you have children, your child can come out any color or any shade of black. You are not guaranteed that if both your parents are, are extremely pale looking, that their child will not come out dark as night. Matter of fact, it has happened more than once where someone was passing or someone in their family was passing. That actually happened to my father-in-law. So one of his family was had passed at great grandmother's level. His niece, great niece, gets married, meets a husband, gets married, they have a baby, the baby comes out black. And nobody, everybody's like, and this is before DNA. So they're like, wait, 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 you cheated on me? And she's like, nope. Okay, then the baby must have been switched. Nope, that's yours. Simply because that was something that was not accounted for was the fact that even no matter how much you might try to lighten up the line, somebody could come in with all the melanin that you thought you had gotten rid of. And 
So that that is also was an Afro Creole challenge as well, because when they part of their status or holding the space that they were in was the color of their skin. The lighter it was, the more believable that you were a free black in that area. The darker it was, the more it was believed that you were a slave trying to pass. You know, regardless of the truth. And so there were families that with that their family members were were slaves. Um, are considered slaves because if they came out darker than the rest of the group, it was their only way of protecting them. Any questions on that? So that's where you get the native. So that's so that precarious place is where fighting for the Confederacy for them was more about being not losing their freedoms because they already had very little freedoms as it was but being told what to do. When they realized that they were not considered equal or as valuable to their white, now why it took the war for them to figure that out, I don't know. But that's when they figured it out, when they were mistreated and treated more harsher than their white counterparts, that's when they decided, forget this, we're switching. We're gonna be a part of the Union Guard. And there was a lot of unrest around that. Because once the Afro Creole community switched over, switched sides, well, the Confederacy didn't last much longer. They kept fighting, but they didn't last much longer in the in the grand scheme. Of and Nathan Daniel, who happened to be Cora Scott's husband, um, was also a union pro-union. So after the fighting had happened, he went back to he went up to um, back to DC to help draft the, the Reconstruction era paperwork that that was a mess and that ended up horribly, horribly. And he that's when he met Cora Scott, married her, and came back to New Orleans, where they lived until he died of the flu, him and his and their daughter. Um, but Cora Scott was also a part of this this craziness. She didn't go to the seance table with Henri that we know of, but she would have known him during this period of time because she spoke at the, in 1866 was the Mechanics Institute riot. This is after the war has ended and the, the Blacks and the Afro Creoles had gotten together, formed a union. They're going to start their own newspaper. Their white counterparts are not happy about this at all and decide basically to massacre them the next day. At the one year anniversary, um, Cora Scott speaks at the anniversary and wrote this really long, wonderful poem in honor of those lives lost at the Mechanics Rescue Way. So that's how interlocked and inter I'm just showing the interlock and the interconnection of our spiritualist pioneers and them and how they were all part of the spiritualist movement. Okay, <clears throat> get back to the table. So in the meantime, they're forming the circle. Valmore has already transitioned. So he visits the table from the spirit world at this time. And the, to get to why we're calling, why I call this circle to harmony, the circle of harmony, a different kind of table, is because why they held seances. So what we know, as we know about seances, tables, is that our purpose is we get together, depending on if we're doing physical, physical mediumship or just working on trance mediumship or Hollywood version of seance. It's to bring through a loved one from spirit, someone's loved one or a loved one from spirit to prove the continuity of life, as well as to bring comfort to those who are grieving. Um, so at this table, hopefully your mom shows up, the medium will tell you all about your mom or come through your mom or you see her mom or what have you, depending on what level that table is there for. We also use seance tables for our development. Sir Carmenique did not use the seance table for that purpose. 
Their purpose, and as they wrote, it was to accelerate the development of the faithful believers. Basically, the purpose of this table was to commune with spirit on how to create a more equitable union and how to be better stewards and participants, activists in the creation of this more equitable union. Henri, at the, during that time, after being in the National Guard, he was also, he served in many civil offices um, and at some point was, what was, I wrote it down. Where did I write it? My brain does not like to work. But he was a senator. He, I believe he was a senator for the House of Representatives in, in New Orleans. Um, actually, most of the people at the table held some sort of position, of a political position, or were fighting or act, are organizing um, activity around rebuilding the nation, so to speak, or at least rebuilding New Orleans in the more equitable way. Um, um, everyone at this table had broken up with Catholicism and had broken up with the Catholic Church. This was evidenced through their seance records of the different Catholic priests who came to visit the table and wanted forgiveness for believing the Catholic way of separation, of hierarchy, of, of you know, dogma over moral and just ethical actions and behavior. Um, <clears throat> So this was an activist seance table. In, in our modern day speak, this would have been a social justice activist group <laughs> that happened to hold seances in order to do their work. They believe that, not only that, but that, and, and so the development part of how you developed your mediumship was the more selfless you were, the more active you were in creating and helping to form a more just, equitable union in your community, the better your mediumship would get. So that was their, that's how they viewed spiritual development. It was about how much you gave back to your community, how much you served your community, how much you helped your fellow people in the community. The more you did, the better your mediumship would get. In other words, they believe that you could be a medium, but in order to develop and become a better medium, this was the role. So I'm going to share my screen for a second, if I can. If I even know what I'm doing. So this is the ladder that they have formed in their, in their, um, in their group and the, the this was the ladder of progress that was in their register that was written in the register the circle believed that individuals went up a ladder of progress to obtain perfection and how you ascended the ladder of progress was involved in your activism how active you were how much you were helping your fellow people in the world the less you did the less likely you were getting up the ladder. And that this ladder existed not just on the human plane, but also was present in the spiritual realm. Those who came to their table were those who were ascending the ladder. If you were not ascending the ladder, you did not show up at their table. Now, how did they organize their table? How did their seances go? This is fun. So, first of all, Spirit did God give them guidelines and rules of how they should organize. And so, and they, and Henri being the writer that he is, wrote it all down. Yay. Um, so, first of all, you're, you had to have a clear mind. You needed to arrive with, and this is, I'm just quoting what they wrote, arrive with abnegation, charity, goodwill, and love of humanity at heart. So if you were in any way like dealing in what I guess they would have called low energies, like you were cranky, you're upset, you was mad at your neighbor, da, 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 and you could not 
put that aside, don't show up to the table that night because you're gonna you're gonna mess it up. Punctuality. They were obsessed with punctuality. Spirit would chastise you if you were late. Um, then, so once you arrive with the clear mind and on time, they would start with a lecture to get every get all the harmonies and the energies in the room. So the lecture was usually on some spiritual communication that they have previously recorded in the previous session that was very inspiring or uplifting or just motivational. Um, and this would also get everybody into in the sink, you know, like we do. Like we usually do a prayer or an invocation where we all kind of just to bring us in the room. They did a full lecture. And when I say a full lecture, I mean a full lecture. Like it could be 45 minutes long or something. Um, during this time and until it was over, you were not allowed to talk about nothing else. You were not allowed to talk about politics. You were not allowed to talk about your out. Not during, not before. No, mm -mm, no cross communication, basically. Um, this was also to keep the room focused on the on the on the universal um, intent of the group, spirit of the group. Then, once the lecture was completed and the door was closed at this point, now here's where the late part comes. There were people who would come after the lecture was done. Because they couldn't get in while the lecture was going on because the door was closed and locked. But when the lecture was done, they opened the door and somebody would be like, I'm here. Well, they frowned on that, but people did do it every once in a while. Sometimes it just you, they were late. And <clears throat> but when if you were one of those people who came after the lecture was done, you were to get to your seat at the table go into meditation and get your mind right. And be quiet and don't disturb everybody else with your prayer because you late. Because they were really about being punctual. Now, when I said take a seat at the table, they had assigned seatings. Not assigned that they assigned them, but once you had your seat, once the table was established, once you were established as a member of that table, you sat in the same chair every Monday. You did not sit in a different chair. It said two chairs over and three chairs to the left. You sat in your chair every Monday. That was your chair. Um, and then they began. And then their spiritual communications were always consistent of uh, previously of spirits coming, usually notables. Like Abraham Lincoln came to the table. Um, very, the popular Catholic priest in their area came to their table. Andrew Jackson Davis apparently came to their table. Various different notables would show up to the table. And they usually proffered some sort of insight or lecture and why they are doing what they're doing, why they should keep doing what they're doing, how they need to keep the faith that spirit is behind them why this is the spiritual way of being, what you're doing is in keeping with how it is to be a true spiritualist and to keep in mind that the, the love of humanity and everything that you're doing is to raise the vibrations of humanity as a whole. By sitting at this table, this is how we prepare to do that. There was also a lot of support coming from the spirit because this is a time, like I talked about, with the Mechanics Massacre, and that was written down, but there were lots of other. There was at one point where the governor of New Orleans was, was basically upseated when he went on vacation, and then the, the other team came in and hampered everybody down, and that went on for about two weeks until the government feds could get the people down there to kick them out and re reset but for like two weeks or whatever it was the other party was ruling and was creating so this was a common they were in a time of, of complete upheaval political spiritual emotional religious because catholicism was huge it was huge and catholicism was in the confederacy camps 
so to speak. So there's a lot of this chaos happening around them. So these tables was their opportunity to sit down and get some kind of clarity in this chaos. And so 35 volumes away. Now, the reason why this has not come out probably sooner than the past 10 or so years, the volumes were written in French, mostly French, old French. So we're talking the 1800s. And he did write some in English, which I'm sure it was also old English. The volumes were in the possession of Duplet, which was his is really good friend who held the registers until about 1920 where he passed them on to his son Grand Jean who fit, held on to him for 50 years interviewed his father-in-law his son-in-law son -in who, who introduced his father-in-law and wrote in the margins notes um, about the different seances that he got from his father-in-law in the notes but he wrote in very tiny writing and hard to read and in French. Um, and then in 1976, I believe it was, he donates the, 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 the entire seance register to the local library at the University of New Orleans. And Melissa Daggett, as well as Emily Suzanne Clark, and a few others take on, Melissa Daggett mostly, but the others as well take on the arduous task of translating the seance registers, the records, and writing books about them and the life and times of the world through the eyes of those who sat at these tables um, based on the register. Because the registers revealed a lot of other information besides they held seances and talked to people and what they did and how they formed, but they also held information of what was going on during that time period in New Orleans and what they were dealing with, because that was also brought to the table by the different people that came through it. So one of, one of the books, most is A Luminous Brotherhood by Emily Suzanne Clark. I put it in the notes as well, or in the, the chat notes. The other one I don't own, but it is, where is it? Spiritualism in the 19th Century, The History of Henri Louis Ray by Melissa Daggett. And the one I don't have up there, um, if you look at, I do actually own his book, uh, Cox. Where are you? Oh, oh here we go. Body and Soul, A Sympathetic History of American Spiritualism by Robert S. Cox. Um, there are some of the people that would borrow from this register to explain not only spiritualism in New Orleans and how it was received by Afro -Cre African Creoles, but also people of New Orleans, but also to give a history of the time during that, that Civil War period of what was going on in New Orleans in respect to who accepted spiritualism, who wasn't, who was open to it. Let me and, ask you a question. Sure. Um, is there, is, did they make a distinction between their uh, religion and spiritualism? Did they understand spiritualism as a religion or yes. were they more involved with catholicism and then there was this this other thing on the side here that they did with uh morality so to speak actually yes they actually looked at spiritualism as a religion Henri and a lot of the people at the table um ended their relationship with catholicism once they became a part of the table. Um, and that's evident through some of the seances of the people that visited the seance table from the Catholic priest or what have you say, yes, Catholicism ain't got it right. They got it all wrong. Spiritualism is the true, the light, the way. It's, it's the, the, 
believe that I highlight it. So that was another thing that was very, um, so Voltaire apparently visited their table and he said, those great pomps of God should keep from the table those who claim to be spiritualists but who have lowered themselves to the level of those extinguishers of thoughts. Oh, he, they consider the Catholic tradition the pomp and apparatus. Um, they were highly, highly, they became highly critical of the Catholic tradition, which under, understandable given that once the Civil War happened, and once it was over, African and Creoles were now just another, they were just another black person. They were in the same, they were now put in the same category, class, because this is classism as well. They're now considered the same class as African slaves. And that their skin color no longer afforded them a certain level of privilege. And then realizing that the privilege that they were afforded because of their skin color really wasn't privilege. And they have put them above slave status, but that's about all it did. They were still being marginalized. They were still being mistreated. They were still being um, excluded from the table. And that spiritualism helped them to really dig into the meat and bones of their own challenges with that, if that makes sense. Um, by becoming a spiritualist, by, be, by sitting at these tables and holding these seances, they were at this point now dealing with their own inner conflicts. Um, as much as they could project it outward, that it's their fault or somebody else's fault, spiritualism made them see that it's, it's in you. You hold the power to change or not change. You hold the power to see yourself as an equal or not see yourself as an equal. And it's on you to do the right thing, no matter how hard it is. Elaine, did you have another comment? Well, question? I, yeah, I do. I, I always yeah. wind up having more questions than answers. <laughs> um, you know, it would be interesting to know uh, if they reached out from their end to the white community and said, please join us at our table uh, because you, you're mentioning people who are obviously white that showed up in their seance rooms. And so they had to have given some thought to um, the lack of distinction in color on the spirit side of life, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there was any uh, effort to reach out and say uh, from the spiritualist community of people who were white to say please join us at our table we'd, we'd love to have you even if it was the Friday night table as opposed to the Monday night table right right, right? <laughs> um, that would be an interesting thing to know what I can understand is that the French that immigrated into New Orleans during that time period what tables were open to to um, Afro Creoles sitting at their tables. However, I just found out about the French um, obsession or the French interest and in the French participation in spiritualism, which is, that's not something I've heard on you know mostly all you know most of what I've heard about spiritualism in in, in the beginning. It's the Northeastern region. Very little of it coming from the South. Now the French immigration, they went straight into New Orleans. Um, so they're, they weren't pro-slavery at all, at least the ones that went. And so it would be interesting to know, and I, I, she does say that there was priests that did show up and ask that their name not be recorded as being in the room. So, but we got to go on the records and, and, and unfortunately, not unfortunately, but generally this is, when you're recording the, the spirit communication, you're not really focused on who's in the room with you, other than who said, who brought who through. So Louise brought in 
I'm just making up names, Voltaire. And Dublé brought in Andrew Jackson and so on and so forth. And so that's when they become a part of the register, I would imagine. They don't exactly become part of the register in an independent sort of way. So basically we're, we're kind of limited to know if they did reach out. I imagine that there was at one time at least, God, I think I counted like 10 or 12 people at their seance table at their heyday, um, which is a large number when you think about a seance table in my mind. Um, and they were committed to it. And their biggest three year period was 71 to 74 was the most popular, um, the most prolific writings that came out of their meetings. But it would have been interesting to see if anybody, I mean, because Cora Scott's not at the table, but then I don't know if Cora Scott's not at the table. Could she have shown up once or, you know, <laughs> visit her? And of course, God didn't write about it. <laughs> and if nobody wrote about it, then we don't know who's there. And that's that unfortunate. I mean, the good thing is, is that because of their level of education and because of where they sat in the class structure, we have writings. The bad part is that the ones that didn't write or the ones that didn't mention them, we don't know about them. I do know that Catholicism went by the wayside and they were not fans of voodoo, they saw voodoo as superstition. They were spiritualists. All right, Prue, were you saying something? Um, yeah. I couldn't back it up, but I, but I do think that uh, because what I know of New Orleans is that they're uh, in high society, that they're, and because they sent their kids to Europe for education, that there was a, a passage of, of ideas between the, the, like the salons mm -hmm. in Paris. And so in New Orleans reflected that, that intellectual centers are always going to have that. So I'm sure that they had, I can't prove it, but I'm, but it, it only makes sense that there would have been, um, uh, cross-pollination of ideas from Europe. So that's, but I don't have any proof. I just know it, but I don't have any proof. <laughs> Elaine? Well, you know, the other side of that coin could be that the, the invitation may have been extended, but because of the pressures put upon them by the white people to not be in association with the black people, that they chose to say, you know, no, I'm not, thanks, but no thanks, just because of the pressure that they would be getting from their counterparts. You know, so the invitation could very well have been extended and, and it was almost like a reverse prejudicial kind of a situation. I, I also want to keep in mind, though, too, that because New Orleans, even today, is still heavily Catholic, right. that you still also have that Catholic pressure. Uh, if I go sit at the seance table, am I still Catholic? Can I still go to church on Sunday? Um, and then, of course, the more you sat at, these, at this table, the less likely you were going to show up to church on Sunday. And how is your family going to receive you? Because there's, there's that too. Like, you could be disowned because you decided not to follow the Catholic way. We all know that that happens now, you know. And I think that there was a, um, not a resurgence, but, um, but a peaking of racism that, it, so it heightened the racism after the Civil War because it's like they were just our neighbors and now they're black neighbors. And then there was a big war about it and we lost. And so, so I think that the racism increased, but, but I do think that, that I'm going to hold with the intellectual circles because intellectuals don't really care what religion you are and they're going to travel back and forth because I just see them uh, traveling back and forth and 
carrying on conversations. And I love New Orleans for the road trip. Oh, I love, love, love. Road trip. Um, I love New Orleans so much. I mean, that energy is insanely phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I was there last year when I went out to um, Houston and Austin to visit the churches in June. On the way back, uh, I road tripped it, and on the way back, I stopped and spent a couple of days in New Orleans. And uh, it was, uh, you know, that it certainly um, culturally uh, flourishing still. I'm sorry, say that last part, Elena didn't hear it. I said it's it certainly it certainly still flourishes culturally. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. When I was in New Orleans last year, I actually stayed in the Treme district, which I didn't know. Treme district is where the circle was. So this circle happened in this area that I'm staying in, which is where at the time the more the, the French Creole were ran the, the Treme area, the Treme district. Um, Henri is actually buried at the the St. Louis Cemetery Number no. Two, which is up the street, I think, from there. Um, which I didn't know that. You know, everybody goes there to see Madame Louvaux, and I'm like, "You mean Henri was here, and I didn't know it?" <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Right, right. Um, so that was that's an exciting part to to know that spiritualism and Buddhism and Catholicism and spiritual, because the spiritual churches tried to combine it all in New Orleans, that whole Leafy Anderson line. That was, that was an attempt at combining it all together, bringing, bring a little bit of the voodoo, bring a little bit of the Catholicism, bring, bring a little bit of the spiritualism, let's put it all in the same pot, and now y'all show up for church, right? Kind of thought. <laughs> but before that, they were separate. So spiritualists were spiritualists, Voodooans were Voodooans, Catholic, Catholics were Catholics. And obviously it was majority Catholic, but there was still a heavy group of Voodooans. And there was a heavy group of spiritualists, or those who believed that they could communicate with the spirit world, believed that they had the ability to heal as, um, because of the spirit world. They may not have thought of themselves as spiritualists at the time, that comes later, but that was their belief system. They didn't, they weren't fancy with the voodoo because they believed that was based on superstition. They could participate in Catholicism because if you look at the Catholic Church, you look at a lot of their rituals and their traditions, there's a lot of spiritual energy that runs through a lot of it. There's still that, okay, it's Jesus, but we'll call him Jesus kind of thought process. We just changed the name of it. If we name all of our daughters Mary, then I can say Mary visited. 